case you guys can't tell, John, just go ahead and, and just get into frame here real quick with me right here so that you can know. Hey, so John actually introduced me. We're sitting literally next to each other, which is the reason that we sound so awful because literally we've got three of us in control headquarters right now trying to introduce everybody. And surprise, I'm your 10 o'clock speaker. So welcome to How to Basics, Basic CIS Controls from the Attacker's Perspective. I'm Aaron Moss. I'm a senior security consultant with True Digital Security. And basically what that means is I hack a lot of things for people who ask me to do so. Um, let's see, let's get this started. Um, so the first slide here is who is Pure Heat. Well, sorry, Pure Heat's not here today. If you guys were expecting Josh Bozarth, um, he sucks and decided not to come and join me today because he was too busy. Uh, he's my boss. I may get fired over this, which will be on the next couple of slides here in a second. So I love you, Josh. <laughs> Who am I? I is Hot Dog. Uh, Aaron Moss at Blockbuster on the Twitters. Uh, I basically just, if, if anybody who don't know who I am, I am uh, basically a horror nut, uh, infosec nut. Uh, I am a Jesus freak, husband, father, and uh, I work my way up from help desk into network system uh, systems and, and virtual machines and stuff like that, administrator into an IT director, into eventually a security consultant and recently a senior security consultant for True Digital Security. Also, I'm one of the B-Sides co uh, OK uh, coordinators and co-founders. I've been here since the beginning. And generally, if you see much of the t-shirts the and everything that have been developed thus far up until this year, I'm the guy who created all the t-shirts and stuff. So you can have me to thank or boo for the t-shirt designs. Um, so today's discussion, let's get onto this. Usually I have somebody, like I said, Josh is here, here with me uh, and, and kind of going over these controls with me. And so uh, in lieu of him being here, I decided to put this little heart around his face on this picture. It's one of my favorite pictures and he hates it. Um, and I, like I said, up right at the top, this will teach him not to show up for a B-sides talk with me again. It could get me fired. It could go either way. I don't know. But what we're going to cover today is the first six of the CIS basic uh, security controls. That's called the basic controls. And how we as attackers use these controls, or the rather the lack thereof, to attack your network. Okay, and this includes pen testers, this includes, uh, you know, attackers, real attackers, which is what pen testers try to emulate to a degree. Uh, and so how these controls can make our job harder whenever they're implemented correctly. Uh, True Digital Security has a lot of clients in retail space, the technology space, medical, financial, education. You can read everything there. Um, you don't need me to actually uh, go through everything to my knowledge. Hopefully I sound okay. I don't know if I do or not because I don't have anybody telling me yes or no, but I'm assuming that I sound okay. So we're going to move on. So what are the CIS security controls? Uh, the CIS controls is originally the, the SANS top 20 critical security controls. Now the CIS controls are the Center for Internet Controls, uh, Internet Security Controls, excuse me. And currently we're at 7.1. That is the time of this writing back in February. That could be updated now to 7.2 or 9.3. Now I'm not entirely sure. But the ones that we're gonna be talking about are the basic security controls today. And so we're looking at uh, the inventory and control of hardware assets and software assets. And what you're going to see is both of those are kind of smooshed together to a degree. And so we're going to go over controls one and two together. And then we're going to do controls uh, three, four, five, and six, continuous vulnerability management, controlled use of administrative privileges, secure configuration uh, for hardware and software on all devices, and the maintenance, monitoring, and analysis of audit logs. These first six are the super important controls that if you get these right, you're going to make it so much harder for an attacker on your network just because you have this, these, these controls implemented. Uh, so a note about the implementation groups. Each of the six controls have numerous sub-controls. If you ever look at this document, it's pretty long. 
And so there's 47 just for the first six controls and 171 sub controls for all 20 of the different uh, controls. And basically you want to self-assess into one of the three implementation groups. You got implementation group one, it's an organization with limited resources, cybersecurity expertise, as it says here. And so, you know, maybe smaller organizations, your, your, maybe your mom and pop shops or sm just smaller orgs. It's like three or five people that are working in the, you know, in the industry and stuff like that. Maybe you have a third party IT company like True Digital Security, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that are coming along beside you and helping with stuff. Implementation to uh, a group two. This is an organization where you have moderate resources. The larger organizations, your mid to small business, you know, small to mid sized businesses and stuff like that. You've got 30 people, you got 50 people, you got 100 people, something like that that you're working with. And so you maybe have some more resources and more control over how some stuff is developed in your system. And so you can have a little bit more control over how things work. And you have implementation group three large organizations or just simply mature organizations with a lot of resources and cybersecurity experience to allocate for all the different sub controls. And so, uh, you know, you're basically, as it says, your certain sub controls are deprioritized based on the resources and cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity expertise. So as you get down further into the implementation groups, you're going to have less and less resources to work with, which is the reason you're going to need a third party to come in, such as true digital security, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That's why I'm here to, to help out with this. Um, so let's go. Eventful inventories. Josh misspelled that and he's just, oh, it's awful. Controls one and two, hardware and software inventories. So I'm not going to read this slide to you. If you really want to get the CIS definition, go look at it. But basically what it means is exactly what it says. You want to inventory and control your hardware and software assets. You want to track them, inventory them, correct them, keep keep track of them. And that's what track means. Keep track of all this stuff and make sure it's all legitimate and that it's all real and that it's all supposed to be there. And quite frankly, you get rid of the stuff that's not supposed to be there. So let's go over hardware inventory. The old standards are servers, workstations, network devices. You can read the list. Uh, but you also have the new stuff. You got mobile. You, yeah, there you go. You can see it now. Phones, tablets, got your iPads, but you also have your IoT devices. How many IoT devices do you actually have on your network right now? You know, copiers and printers are IoT devices, maybe cameras and video conferencing and stuff like that. Um, what about your smart assistants? What about stuff like Siri? What about stuff like, um, hang on. Okay. Just making sure that somebody not saying they can't hear me. Sorry about that. You know, your smart assistants. What about Alexa? What about, uh, uh, what do you got? Like Google Home. What about uh, your Apple? What's the Apple devices that sit on the networks? I can't remember off the top of my head. Or, you know, that weird little box in the corner that the service repairman installed. What is that? Hmm. If you see something like that, unplug it and see if somebody screams. Uh, don't forget your alphabet soup. This is more along the lines of specialized uh, organizations, you know, medical devices. So you're going to be looking at hospitals. You're going to be looking at, uh, uh, at, at clinics and stuff like that. But you got your infusion pumps, MRIs, CT scanners, uh, PIC, which I, I think Josh may have thrown that acronym in there to, to screw with me. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but you also have, so on the other side of stuff, your, your energy sector, you know, SCADA, HMI, PLC, PID, RTU, EIEIO, that one I threw in there myself. But you get the idea. All these devices are the part of your hardware assets that you need to keep control of. Let's look at your software assets. Of course, you've got your operating systems for both servers and workstations. You've got your virtualization, your hypervisors, ESXi, Hyper-V, blah, 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 blah. Server software, you've got Exchange, SQL, IIS, the works. You know, Jira um, was, was some more. You've got, um, uh, what's that one I just popped the other day? I was, uh, man, I can't remember. His other... Other other software uh, asset, uh, assets out there for like uh, controlling, um, man, I cannot remember. I'm the worst. Anyway, so you've got your, your document readers, Office, Google Docs, Adobe, 
uh, Creative Cloud, Collaboration, Slack. I'm a huge Slack fan. I'm in Slack all the time. Uh, teams, I hate. Can't stand Teams. <laughs> Get your browsers. If you're using Flash on your network still yet, shame on you. Um, music, I'm a huge Spotify fan. Haven't used iTunes in a long time. BitTorrent, etc. So here we are at the crossroads of this. Hardware or software? As an attacker, we don't really care. Did you forget that server existed? We found it. It wasn't patched or updated. It was a 2003 server. It was missing a couple of patches, including 17010. If you're not familiar with that, go look up how bad Microsoft, the MS 17010 exploit is. Uh, a couple of times we've actually found Windows XP machines that people forgot about on a system or on a network that have uh, MS 08067. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that's another one that's a super, super bad uh, remote code execution vulnerability. Um, and we just used it to, to, to compromise your entire network. So what does up to me up to date inventory mean? IT knows what's on the network. IT knows what should not be on the network. And it's keeping track of all this stuff. Again, keeping track of all this stuff. Keeping track of, oh, did you see that pop up on there just now? Where did that come from? That shouldn't be there. Somebody go check that out. Software, same as old hardware, attackers all leveled software. We love Adobe, Java. You'll see all sorts of exploits for like Adobe Reader for any number of versions of Java and, and tons of Java deserialization exploits and all sorts of stuff like that. So basically what you can do with these smaller attacks, even though it may only be, uh, you know, maybe you get just a foothold on a network, it can leave your doors open for wide, big attacks, okay? And so other things that you can do, you might be able to lace a PDF or something, a Word doc, uh, and, and send it to somebody, email somebody, say, hey, click on this, open this document, or open this zip file, or open this blah, 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 and all of a sudden, we've got access to your network. You got an open port somewhere, easy exploitation if that port, if that service on that port is vulnerable. So attacker view number one, again, here we are, weak inventories. We hate these networks for tests. This is a really hardened internal network. Uh, as, a, as a tester myself, I hate these networks. That's the reason I know that. But I've talked to several other people that, yeah, yeah, this is part of what we do as pen testers. I'll be honest with you, it's fun. It's one of the reasons we got into this. But also the other thing is, is we want to help people to grow and to, to better, better understand how their network works. And so we get onto an, an internal Windows network that, Everything's patched. There's tons of servers, but it's all patched. We the responders not working. We're not seeing any LLM and R or NetBot. Excuse me, NetBIOS over TCP. No WPAD. Like there's no broadcast traffic hardly at all, and it's it's just do a, a fantastic job. None of the tools work that we're trying to use. Wait, did you see that on the scan? That's an old Windows 2000 server. Just been not been touched since like 2007. And it's missing MS 08067. So what do we do? Pop up Metasploit. We get a shell on it. We have local admin. We create that weak password. And then uh, turns out that password used everywhere else. Hey, guys, I want you to know passwords are a part of your software assets. Change them and keep track of them in a secure fashion. All right? Because we just use that password to privilege escalate all the way to domain admin on your super hardened Windows network. Uh, attacker view number two, external network, minimal exposed services. So, you know, maybe you have a couple of open web ports, you know, like the end. You've got 60 servers on the network, but they're firewalled off, they're hardened. Great, great, great job. Except for that one port on the server, like what was that? Uh, it was like 4447. <laughs> what is this? We open it up, try to tell net to it, nothing, try to net cat to it, can't figure out exactly what it's going to do. Uh, it gives us some kind of HTTP information back, but not a whole lot. Turns out that it was a HTTPS server. And so we opened it up in Chrome. It's a desktop management software exposed to the internet. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, but the authentication is tied to the domain. Well, that sucks. Okay, fine. Now, this says here, great, that was close. And that means, you know, we want our customers, we want our clients to have proper controls in place that don't allow us to do things. But that default admin account 
still exists on there with a default password and we just logged in and had full access to your internal network via all the baked in remote desktop capabilities that says no but what we're actually thinking is yes just so you know attack review number three external pen test ftp server so this was one where we had a vulnerability it was documented online it basically it said you know hey we have we know there's a known vulnerability in this FTP server, but there was no exploit code for it. The server was free. Um, it wasn't open source, but we were able to download it and then basically reverse engineer it a little bit, find out a way to, the, to actually basically find the, the point of vulnerability in the server, rolled our own exploit, and then voila, we have, uh, we have remote code execution. So if you want to find out more about this, uh, feel free to join me next year next year sorry anybody who registered this year i just i was too busy and everything just didn't work out too well for the exploit development class that i am working on uh still actively developing um but join me next year besides okay 2021 for the exploit development class and i swear to god i'm going to teach this class next year seats are limited so hurry um and um yeah, as Josh actually put on there, sure, this is like the like this is the end of the shameless plugs. Um, so this attack is view number four. We got a full scope red team engagement. This is same old, same old. You know, we got external, internal. There's no physical on it, but we're doing some phishing. We're doing some, I hate that term, phishing. We're doing some phone call phishing and stuff like that, social engineering. Everything was really locked down, so we made some phone calls and eventually talked to some sales reps. Sales reps are fun because sometimes they want to keep you on the phone while you want to keep them on the phone and ask them tons of questions. So we sent an email after the phone call and the laced PDF and said, hey, called them back. Did you get the PDF? Yeah, we did. Okay, great. If you just take a look at this stuff that I sent you, that'd be great. And while they opened it, as soon as they opened it, it wasn't blank. It had some stuff in it, but we had access to their network. So, control ideas. Manage your full inventory, hardware, and software. This is a really, really hard, really, really big full-time job, often for more than one person. What about your BIOD? Well, you're going to have to figure that out, too. You start with your full physical inventory. You want to map your location. You want to map the serial number, the MAC address, if you can, because uh, IPs can change especially you know, even it, it, most people are going to a DHCP, like a reserved DHCP network anymore. And there's a lot of tools out there that can help you keep this inventory accurate. Spiceworks is good for some smaller networks and stuff. There's Landsweeper, there's Open Audit. InMap can help just to get you started to figure out where stuff is at on your network. Um, I don't personally endorse any of these necessarily, except for Spiceworks that I've used way back in the day, but I have no idea how it works now. These are just some ideas to get you started. Uh, policy is key. You're going to see this reference over and over and over and over again in this presentation that policy is key. Having a living, breathing policy can help you greatly reduce the amount of software on the network. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, organizational policy as well as technical. So you already have acceptable use policies and stuff like that documenting what you can and cannot have on your network. Well, your technical policies are server side. These are the ones like your group policies, your software restriction policies that you can say, hey, this software is or is not allowed on these computers, on these laptops, these workstations, the server, et cetera, and it cannot run even if it is installed. Have that going. Now, again, this takes a lot of time but can save you a ton of headache in the long run. Or <laughs> you can call us here at True Digital Security. We're experts at all things IT, including inventory, and we're really good at helping develop policies. Seriously. And yeah, there's about five or six more of these plugs coming, so uh, get ready to live. So uh, continuous vulnerability management. Again, I'm not going to read this, but you can kind of get the idea. It's called continuous vulnerability management. Okay pretty simple so it takes several forms but what you're looking at is you're looking at service management vulnerability scanning and patching okay you're looking at basically killing the servers to the services that you don't need okay and making sure the services that you do need are hardened you, that comes with the vulnerability scanning scanning to find out what patches are missing and the updates of software on a system so once you see that there's patches missing patch a system it's 
pretty simple. Now, I know that's not always the easiest thing to do because sometimes patches can break stuff, but that's a risk. It, it, it's part of your risk profile. You figure out which way you want to move. Basically, is your risk profile, yeah, we can take a hit if a patch breaks something, or we can take a hit if we don't patch something and we get popped got to figure that out for each organization. And again, as I said, this is a constant cycle. Lather, rinse, repeat. Always repeat. And this joke will come up again later because quite frankly, again, this is a constant cycle. Lather, rinse, repeat. Always repeat. It's taking the first two controls, adding an action. So what is vulnerability management? And why is it important? Think of vulnerability management as vulnerability inventory, except we want this item to decrease in size. So while your normal inventory and everything will actually go up as a general over time, we want to see vulnerabilities actually decrease. You want to see these, this number of the vulnerabilities go down. Now, that's not always possible because, quite frankly, you know, <laughs> new software is developed and new bugs come out all the time. So it's kind of hard to keep up with stuff, but this is the reason it's a full-time job as well. And so broken record time, we like to take advantage of unpatched software. Think of, you know, we watch for new CVEs. Uh, we're looking for software that we're targeting. We check for public exploits. And sometimes we have to actually just write our own exploits. Um, so here's the attacker's view. This is an interesting one right here. Sandbox Escaper on Twitter tweeted a zero day local privilege escalation exploit in Task Scheduler uh, on Windows. And it, you can actually read the tweet. Ugh, they were just upset, just done. And so Microsoft released that patch cycle two days, two weeks later uh, during the regular patch, the patch Tuesday cycle. Uh, it is CVE 2018, oh, uh, excuse me, 8440, which is the Windows ALPC elevation privilege vulnerability. Uh, you can find out more information there. But uh, I mean, this is the stuff we're constantly looking for. Here's another one. This is a really interesting one. We actually use this at the beginning of the year. Most of the Citrix stuff has been patched. And I say most. If your organization is paying attention, it should be patched by now. Um, Citrix disclosed a remote code execution vulnerability in the Citrix application gateway controller. And so basically what that would do is it would allow an attacker, as it says, to perform remote code execution. So security researchers and malicious actors race to create an exploit following the bread comes released by Citrix explaining the vulnerability. And basically we took the patch and kind of reverse engineered it and then tried to figure out how it all worked together. Uh, Sans Honeypots on January 3rd of 2020 started detecting active exploitation. So it's not just security researchers. It was actually like illegitimate criminal hackers that were trying to uh, exploit this and were gaining access to stuff. On January 10th, TrustedSec released a, proof, uh, released a proof of concept for the exploit. And then on January 24th, Citrix released a permanent fix in the form of uh, CVE 2019 uh, 7, uh, 781. Um, and it worked, <laughs> but it only works if you apply it. So here's the thing about continuous vulnerability management. This control takes place before, during, and after controls one and two. You have to keep an eye on your vulnerabilities while you're building your inventory, while you're maintaining your inventory, and after inventory is done. And so continuous, as it says, is subjective. It depends on several factors. Again, this kind of goes back to the implementation groups we talked about earlier. If, you have a, if you're in a smaller implementation, implementation group, then continuous is going to be like, mm, maybe we get to this every couple months or so, or you have somebody come alongside you to help you. Um, it all depends on your available resources. You know, larger organizations probably have a much better time trying to develop this stuff to work with. Um, and so, but generally what we suggest is scans could, should be at least every couple of weeks. We're talking like vulnerability scans, network scans, and stuff like that. And of course, larger networks, depending on the size, can take so much longer, but still it's worth it. The key thing here to remember is vulnerability remediation is a team sport. Uh, so your control ideas, we're continuing on here, you want to prioritize your highest level, most critical vulnerabilities first. This seems kind of obvious. So if you've got like a remote code execution vulnerability somewhere, patch it like 
you don't want to wait for somebody to exploit that, gain access to your network. And, oh, actually, you didn't know that you had access to that network. Or you didn't know that there was an attacker that had access to your network, did you? Um, if you don't need the service, uninstall it. It's really simple. What we generally recommend is that you basically turn it off for a month, disable the service for about a month or so, and then see if anybody screams. And if nobody screams, uninstall the service so you don't have to worry about it ever again. And then, of course, if you have to reinstall it for some other reason, you can do it from there. Um, don't forget your low-level ones. Uh, attackers, I'm telling you, we love to use these lower-level lower level exploits because we can chain them together. Privilege escalate, and we've got access on your internal network. Um, what about configuration management? See control number five. So again, policy is a major key. It's organizational and technical, as we discussed before. Windows updates a big one. You know, just continually have Windows updates running. It's up to you how you want to do it, but we highly recommend that it's done over time. Uh, or you can again call True uh, about vulnerability management. You can ask uh, Anderson sometime about my ask me about our vulnerability or ask me about vulnerability assessments t-shirt. He has one of those or two of them because that's uh, kind of what he did for a long time. Uh, control number four, controlled use of admin privileges. I shouldn't have to explain this, so I'm not going to explain this, but control your use of admin privileges. Keep people from having admin privileges. So really, keep people from having admin privileges on their system or domain admin, network admin, system admin, whatever. Do you really need admin all the time? I mean, I do because, you know, it's the easiest way for me to function in my job. But my job is to break your network. Changing all your default passwords, admin, 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 password, admin, Cisco. Still see that sometimes. Admin, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, we see this on a lot of copiers. Um, admin Tomcat. You'd be really surprised how many Tomcat servers are still on the internet. On the internet, open to the internet with admin Tomcat. Not kidding. Policies are key. Lather, rinse, repeat. In short, don't give everyone, or really anyone if you can help it, admin privileges. Uh, ask simple questions before granting access. Who needs the access? What kind of access is needed? When is access needed? Why? Why do you need the access? That's a very key question. Why do you need the access? And how long do you need the access until you no longer need the access? So if you've got a business case that shows that you need the access, find a way to grant it for a short time and then turn it back off. When an admin account is compromised, attackers have a filled day. I love compromising admin accounts. It makes my day. It makes my job that much easier. Um, but it also makes it that much harder because whenever you had to report on stuff like that, it just takes a lot of time. Uh, the attacker's view here. So over 80% of organizations have some form of shared administrator credentials. This is an arbitrary number, but it's just kind of been our experience that quite a bit – probably over 80, I'm guessing more like over 90, uh, have some form of shared administrator credentials on uh, servers, network devices, workstations, and laptops, et cetera. And some orgs just have users with full administrator uh, privileges on their own system. Uh, this, is, this is bad. I like it. But to be honest, this is very, very bad. And we'll take advantage of this uh, because a lot of times local admin, can we can just use that to get anywhere else we want to go. The graph is from the 2019 Verizon DBIR report showing an uptick in breaches attributed to system admins. And this is from 20, uh, it says 2017. Oh, okay. Well, that's 2017 at that line. And actually you can see at 2019 at the end of that graph, how it's just gone completely higher. And the breaches aren't from logic bombs or insiders, but mostly in the form of errors on the part of sysadmins. It says, these are either by misconfiguring servers to allow for unwanted access or publishing data to a server that should not have been accessible by all site viewers. Please close those buckets. Uh, again, change all your default passwords. This is why hardware and software inventory is so important because we're going to find the stuff that IT forgot. All right, we're going to test those passwords. We're going to see if you have default passwords somewhere. Uh, for your Windows stuff, MS Labs. 
Uh, there's a blog post I wrote a couple of years ago called Defending Against Past the Hash. It goes over what laps his, how it works and everything. And then the second blog post following that is actually how you can implement it on your network. Highly recommended because it basically changes every local admin password that it touches to a unique password for that system. And you can set it to change it as often as you want. Or you can call true. And uh, yeah, call true to digital security. Uh, Control five. I'm actually getting through this a lot quicker than I expected. I think me and Josh's banter kind of, kind of hamper stuff at times. He told me that I was going to go really slow on this and go until 11:30, and I told him he was wrong. Uh, control five. Secure configuration for servers, workstations, and mobile. Now you might think that a lot of this is is kind of redundant to a degree, and you'd be right to a degree. So again, you want to track, report. And, and correct security configurations of mobile, laptop, servers, workstations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It kind of fits hand in hand with, it, it, goes, it goes alongside, we'll just say, the software and hardware inventory, okay, controls one and two. And so this is where it gets a little bit harder though, because you're looking at actual configurations here. Right, you're creating and managing, and you're storing configurations. Uh, where are you storing them at? That's a good question each each particular organization is going to have to figure that out. I take it from Paul Asadorian, who said a long time ago on podcasts when I used to listen, when it was still Paul.com, it's now Security Weekly. Good security is just good system administration. And so if you're doing good system administration, security will be baked in to a degree. There are certain things you have to do along the way, but it's very helpful. And it's also helpful to take it in bite-sized chunks. And so, again, <laughs> policies are key. If you see the pattern, great. If you're not yet, policies are key. Let me repeat myself. Policies are key. Lather, rinse, repeat, always repeat. Secure configurations include, and this is not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination. This is just something for you to get started with, right? Disabling and uninstalling services. Does that sound familiar? Mobile encryption with full disk encryption. All right. We're talking like laptops and, and iPhones, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that goes out of your network needs to be fully encrypted. Strong encryption keys, strong encryption algorithms. Uh, that depends on what your network is. Do your own research. Change your default passwords on everything. And don't use the same password twice anywhere if you can. Uh, configuring software to disallow certain functionality. Think of Office with macros. Think of Adobe PDF with JavaScript enabled. Um, secure configurations for remote desktop. Now, this is, uh, again, do your own research on this because there's conflicting information on this and also BlueKeep kind of, uh, yeah, BlueKeep was, was an interesting vulnerability. Um, Network devices with in the default or insecure SNMP community strings. If you're still using public or private, seriously, seriously, and wireless, are you using web keys? I rarely ever see web anywhere anymore. Everything's usually WPA2. Now, with that being said, you can still have bad passwords with WPA2 that's still pretty easily crackable. Um, with a pretty strong setup or just my laptop sitting here can crack WPA2 in a matter of minutes with a really weak password that's found in a password list. Um, so why is this important? Secure configurations, again, can stop a whole lot of attacks. Your threat landscape's changing a lot, but your secure configurations really don't. There's a lot of secure configuration locations. I think I've actually got a slide here somewhere that can give you some more resources on this. Um, but you've got like your NIST configurations, you've got, um, um, there's, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, I should have went through this last night, but that's okay, we'll move on. Starting with a secure configuration on a system is gonna bake your security into the overall process. Now it's not gonna bake security into your entire network unless you do it on all the different systems, but at least having this as a start, and that's super important so that you can build off of it. And trying to implement security after something's been installed can make something go seriously wrong. Stigs, that's what I was trying to think of a while ago. You apply a stig wrong, oh man. It could totally fry your system. Like you, it's unusable. You have to rebuild it from scratch and that's gonna be a pain in the butt. So maintenance over time can lead to more successful security maturity. 
whereas no maintenance can can lead to system instability, but also if you maintain it in the wrong way and you actually disable some of the security configurations, well, you kind of kind of shot yourself in the foot, haven't you? And this isn't just about attacks. This is just simply about, again, good system administration. Attacks are one thing, but if you apply something wrong and it takes down your system, that's problematic, isn't it? And, uh, well, I think we all remember how this turned out. <laughs> So attackers use system misconfigurations to exploit a lot of default functionality. Again, I talk about Windows LM and R and NetBIOS over uh, NetBIOS over uh, TCP. Um, uh, those are two name services, basically resolution name resolution services that Windows uses after DNS uh, or with DNS rather sometimes. Uh, and then we as attackers, we use a tool called Responder to get user credentials because it's real easy. We can attack those credentials or we can relay those credentials on, a, on particular types of networks that don't have message signing uh, enabled to uh, gain access to servers or gain access to other systems that we can use that, uh, that are administrator level credentials. Uh, example two, laptops with no full disk encryption. If you're not using full disk encryption and somebody steals your, your laptop, I don't have to explain what's going to happen there. It's real easy to pull that data up and, and we, most laptops, we don't even have to crack the password to get access to the data. We just pull the hard drive out and uh, your default SNMP security uh, community strings, public and private. If I have to say anything else about this on my screen. So it's not the simplest control on this list, but it's not the most difficult. It does take a lot of time and effort. It takes a lot of human resource. It takes a lot of capital de depending on, you know, how it's implemented. All right. But like the inventory after the initial configuration is complete, maintenance should be a whole lot easier. You get it done the first time and you maintain it properly. It'll go a whole lot easier every other time. There's several NIST and CIS benchmarks. A checklist available. You got your DOD STIGs, you got OpenSCAP, and you got your CIS hardened images, which are cloud-based services, which is another thing you need to be incorporating into your, um, your inventory, right? Your inventory for your hardware and your software needs to include all sorts of cloud-based services, something I didn't cover earlier, but it's, it's simply something you need to do. We can make these slides available to you so that you can check out more of these resources later. This is this NIST checklist, benchmarks, hardened images, the STIGs from the DOD, uh, and OpenSCAP, which is a, uh, I forget, it's, it's something, uh, something along the lines of either the, the STIGs or, or uh, the CIS benchmarks. I can't remember off the top of my head, but you can do more research on that later. In it's kind of in between. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Or you can call us here at True. I swear there's just one more of these. <laughs> um, so audit logs. Now this was Josh's joke, insert lumberjack joke. And I got to be honest with you, it's one of my favorites because that's pretty great. Audit logs, come on. Collect, manage, and analyze audit logs of events that can help detect, understand, or recover from an attack. Honestly, it applies to more than just attacks. But we're primarily focused on that from the attacker's viewpoint. I did say this definition because quite frankly, this is a really fantastic definition. So logs are everywhere. You've got Windows event logs, you've got IS logs, Apache logs, Sys logs. Um, you've got your, your logs that you use for wood, et cetera. Um, logs are critical to everything. Logs are critical for your system security. They're not only from attacks, but also from system and application failure, which is an important part of uptime. So what happened? Why did it happen? How did it happen? When did it happen? All of this information is super, super duper important. But there's a lot of logs to keep track of. How do we keep track and monitor all of them? There's so many, so many. Windows logs alone have over 400 types of event IDs, okay? What about SharePoint, SQL Server, MySQL, Oracle, Exchange, Linux, Syslog, Apache, IIS, Nginx, the works, so on and so forth. You've got to keep track of all of this stuff. My goodness, how do you keep track of that? It's hard. So the biggest problem is finding the resources to manage the logs properly. Enter the sim. All right, I feel like we need to have an enter the dragon here or something. I don't know. Security information and event management platform. It's a centralized log and analysis, uh, log management and analysis tool. 
basically this is a, a giant server, if you will, that has a lot of, of, of data capacity on it that will take in and ingest all these logs and do event correlation. You're looking at stuff like Splunk or you're looking at stuff like um, um, uh, there's other ones out there that I can't think of alien vault um, tons of other, uh, other sims out there that do a lot of this stuff and log, ma log management and analysis, as it says here is a full-time job. Even in small organizations, you have a ton of logs all the time that you have to keep track of. But SIMS can greatly reduce that effort and management because they do a lot of the tracking and a lot of the correlation for you. However, it requires a lot of tuning in the beginning and a lot of maintenance while it's running. So you got your storage of logs. It's got to be in a safe and secure location. They shouldn't be alterable by an attacker. An attacker should not be able to access it. Basically, all the logs are doing is coming in and being stored there. There should be no way to alter these in any way because an attacker can include somebody internal to your network that's an employee of yours that want to change something that they shouldn't have done that you could have seen. All right, and this is where tuning comes in. It says you gotta have to, to, to cut out that noise to get the best signal, and noise is unnecessary logs, and unnecessary logs are gonna depend on whatever you deem as unnecessary on your network. So monitoring, this is super important. Someone is checking those logs are coming in and flowing properly, right? Someone's watching the logs and making sure that each individual server, or the majority of your servers, or however you guys have it set up, at least that they're still coming in. And you notice when something is not coming in. That's odd. We should go check that out. Now you have analysis, log correlation. How do they tell a story? Each log, whenever they're just in one piece, yeah, you can use that sometimes to figure out what's actually happening with the system, why it's not working. But a lot of the times, whenever you're looking at the logs, if you're looking at one log, you got, mm, okay, nothing. But once you expand that out, you start seeing several hundred thousands of logs. Yeah, it's a lot of data to take in, but you can follow the connect, you know, connect the dots and figure out how something happened. And that's what's important. You can follow those patterns, show how the attacks or a system failure progressed. And the proper log analysis can show an entire check chain. So real time proper analysis can lead to faster incident response. You can go from months or years of knowing that something happened to days or hours or seconds. The idea is that this control is not really focused on attacks. It's focused on detecting attacks. As Dr. Eric Cole says, and I used to be a SANS, uh, SANS mentor for this class that he wrote, prevention is ideal, but detection is a must. Detection is a must. And detection far too often goes unnoticed or noticed too late. This is why you have months or years of attackers being on a network that nobody knows they're even there until it's far too late. However, when detection is early enough, prevention can succeed. Hey, look, that leather, rinse, repeat. Always repeat, Homer J. So install a SIM, tune the SIM, tune your network and devices to then log to the SIM, tune the SIM and network again. Lather, rinse, repeat, always repeat. Lather, rinse, repeat, always repeat. Uh, broken record time. And then watch those logs come in and get alerts when something looks suspicious. Yeah, I read that entire slide, but quite frankly, it's just, that's the best way to explain it. Or again, you can call True Digital Security. Now, I'm not going to lie. This is one of the more important slides because we actually have an entire NOC devoted, a SOC devoted to doing this type of thing for our clients. And we'll be glad to help you with anything, including all kinds of audits, logging, logging, uh, audit, logging, auditing logs, logging audits, and lo logging audit logs and logged audits. So uh, <laughs> if you're still here with me, I really appreciate it. I love you guys. You made it. So are you looking to get a head start on the CIS control number 20? Uh, if you don't know what that is, that's penetration test and red team exercises. That's what I do. And that's what we love to do. Uh, so maybe you're ahead of the game. Maybe you've completed all the different basic and foundational controls and everything. And you're just looking to get directly to control 20, or quite frankly, you just have that little checkbox that you need to get taken care of. We're glad to help you with that. Um, our sales response is, we'll be glad to meet your control objectives. My response is, yes, please let me attack your network because I want to see how far I can get because I love my job and I'm really, really good at it. So 
Thanks for joining me today, everybody. We really appreciate it uh, that you came to this talk. Um, I cannot believe that I actually made this talk in like 45 minutes or less. This is this is the craziest thing that I've done in a while. I'm sure that everybody's going to be uh, giving me grief here in a little bit for going so soon and uh, being so long on my other talks. But remember, everybody, tip your waiter as you leave. Appreciate you guys. Oh, hey, my slashback video thing is on there. That's awesome. Probably. <laughs> Let me see if I can turn that off real quick. You guys are still seeing me. Hang on. Man. Thank you so much, everybody, for getting into the track and talking about the stuff that uh, that I was unfamiliar with, like OpenScap. I remember that back in, like, February whenever I did it, but I cannot – for the life of me remember it now i'm going to turn this back over to john real quick hopefully if i can figure out how to get out of zoom thanks everybody for joining us